Are you guys willing to follow Jesus? All right, let's get into some worship.
worship you with all that we are. And that includes all of our time. Just every moment that we live, help it to be, to glorify you, to point to you. And help us to share you with those around us, not just with our words, but the way that we act. We thank you for this evening. Please open our hearts to receive what you have to tell us. And thank you for this day. We pray this in your name. Amen. Announcements with you uh, to get the evening started. The first few involve uh, children's ministry and kids' ministry. On Saturday nights now, we do have a full children's ministry, so all the way from nursery through fifth grade. Uh, if they've been thinking about shifting from Sunday morning to Saturday evening. That's available for the little kids. Also, um, coming up the first weekend of June is the kids' ministry move update. So this will affect kindergarten through youth. You can begin on June 4th and 5th to check your kids into the grade that they will be going into. So that's going to be a change for you um, if you have children of those ages. So rising sixth graders, they can join uh, the, the youth in the sanctuary in here on Wednesday nights. Uh, they'll be in here. And then rising ninth graders can join high school group on Sunday nights. So that'll be a change for them. And then the graduating seniors who are at least 17 years old. So you have to be graduating and 17 can join us for Revive on Monday nights here at 630. Also with the little ones, uh, Parents Day Out, there's still openings and registration uh, for the summer and fall. And so if you're interested in that, you can find the forms at the Welcome Center. And uh, we're growing, which is a great problem, but it exposes our needs, right? So there's a need for more ushers. Uh, we have issues on Sunday morning finding seating. So if that's somebody you would like to assist in and leading people and helping people on Sunday mornings, especially, you can serve in that way. You can uh, find the Start Serving page on our website or call the church office and we'll try to get you lined up and, and serving in that ministry. Also right now, with all this going on uh, with the abortion issue, there's a documentary out. It's called The Matter of Life is the name of it. May 16th and 17th, it will be showing at participating Regal Cinemas. And this movie is made to encourage us to get more involved in this issue. Also to help us be more informed and equip us to pray more effectively um, for the abortion issue. And so if you need more information about that, the website you can visit is The Matter of Life. Dot org, and you can find information there. And so with that, let's stand up and say hello to family. Exciting. It is always full. It is always satisfying. Lord, there is no better meal on the earth than your word. Um, if there's ever a problem, it's me. So I pray that tonight you let my mouth be yours. I pray, Lord, you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray you speak clearly, Lord, to your people because you love your people, Lord, and you want to speak to them and you want to encourage them. And so I pray tonight would be a night of love and encouragement for your people. So we ask you to anoint this time, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 20. Now, as we get into, remember, Isaiah pretty much, for the most part, is a book of the judgments of God. I mean, God uses Isaiah as a prophet to pronounce judgment against the nations, not just Israel and Jerusalem, but the nations. And so we're going to see some of that tonight and some of the things that God asked Jeremiah to do. I'm sorry, Jeremiah, Isaiah to do. 
Um, pretty amazing what we're going to see Isaiah here at the very first um, do. And something I think, wow, again, I always talk about, I'm glad I'm not a prophet. Um, you know, the things the prophets had to do. I'm sure that God uh, made it wonderful as far as his grace and his spirit. But it was a very humbling thing. Nothing wrong with being humbled. But you're going to see here what God asked Isaiah to do. And then when I um, tell you a little bit more about Isaiah, of course, just, just hear what it says. So chapter 20, verse 1. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, he fought against Ashdod and took it. Now, Tartan, that's just a name. These are titles. Sargon is a person. Kind of sounds like an evil character from a movie, doesn't it? Sargon is attacking quick, you know, gather the forces or whatever. Well, Sargon really was. Tartan just means commander-in-chief. So he, Tart, uh, Sargon sends his commander-in-chief, which is Tartan, we don't know his real name, who was the king of Assyria to fight against Ashdod and take it. Now, Ashdod, they were, the, uh, they were the Philistines. There were five Philistine cities there on the coast. Ashdod, one of them. They were Phoenicians. They were famous for their blinds. And um, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. Although I should resist, I couldn't. But there were the Phoenicians. There were five different regions there. There were all the Philistines. Again, Israel's ancient enemies. And at this time, they were enemies of the Assyrians. Well, Assyria really was trying to conquer everyone. The ruling power of this region at this time was Assyria. And we're going to get into some, um, again, long-term worldview stuff, history stuff as we get into this, as the prophet sees in the future. But Assyria is the one that's challenging everyone at this time in that region. And they're coming to take um, Ashdod, which, by the way, is close to Israel, not that far. So this would have made um, Israel nervous because if you see Ashdod falling, you realize, well, we're probably next because Assyria is capturing that whole region. Uh, region. And as you guys know, Hezekiah, this is when Hezekiah later on will cry out to the Lord and will see God intervene and destroy Sennacherib, the commander of Assyria, and kill 185,000 troops in one night there on the Mount of Olives because uh, he challenges, Sennacherib challenges God and all that. You probably know the story. We'll, we'll get to that later. But so, still at this point, all they know is, is that Assyria is taking over the region and they're being threatened. And now Ashdod is taken. Uh, verse 2, at the same time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take your sandals off your feet. And he did so walking naked and barefoot. Now, this needs some explanation, quite obviously. But it only goes from hard to harder for Isaiah. One of the things that God did with his prophets is that he would have them live out his prophecy. He would have them act out his word. When you look at the prophets throughout scripture, I mean, these guys are, they're building miniature, you know, uh, Jerusalems and knocking down walls and crawling through the walls and, you know, doing all these things. They lived it out. So they were very demonstrative. They were very, um, uh, the prophets of old, they could really, they didn't just build a picture for you mentally as they shared the word of God. You know, as they, as they shared, you could see the word of God. It was, it was a gift God gave them. But in addition to that, they were, they were acting it out. I mean, they were literally doing what God was telling them to do. Now, in this case, God is making a, a, an example of Isaiah to show them what was going to happen. And when I say it went from hard to harder, he was already wearing sackcloth. Sackcloth is a very uncomfortable material. Probably the closest thing we have here to sackcloth would be a potato sack. So if you've ever done those uh, uh, you know, potato sack races where you hold on to it and put one leg in it, imagine wearing that on your body. And you feel how rough that is. That's what he was wearing. Now, why would you do that? It was a sense of the prophet showing to the people you know, God is miserable with where we are right now. And I'm showing you visibly how miserable it is. This is uncomfortable. God doesn't like it. I don't like it. You shouldn't like it. And you should repent. So sackcloth was a sign of misery before God or discontent or itchiness or just unsettled. You couldn't be comfortable. Something's wrong. It's not right with God. And those of you, when you've slipped away into sin, maybe for a temporary amount of time, you know that feeling that you have? It's just not right. Something's off and you know what it is. You know you're not walking with God like you should. And the pastor says, hey, now, if you've fallen away from the Lord and you need to make it right today, you're the one out there that goes, and we've all been there from time to time in some area where we're struggling, you know. And, and, and the pastor says, you know, it's time to come back. And you feel that sense of, I know I need to. It's not right. Something's not right with God. That's, in a sense, spiritual a, a, a sackcloth that you're wearing. You're not in that good relationship, a comfortable relationship with God, I might say, in that sense. But here he is wearing sackcloth, showing the nation where they are before God. And then he says, now, take the sackcloth off. That would have been good news. Thank you, Lord. I can finally get this sackcloth off. And take off your, your sandals. Well, that's not so good. How long will that be? Because it's all rocks over there. If you've ever been to anywhere near Jerusalem or that region, it's all rocks, right? And he says, walk around naked and barefoot. Now, Lord, it was bad enough. And now it's this. Let me explain the naked part. 
it wasn't fully naked, as we would think. You know, God wasn't asking him to be totally nude. Now, you may read, uh, if you're a studier, you may read some commentators who say they believe it was totally nude. And, 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 and who knows? We may get to heaven and find out, yes, it was. I don't believe so. Uh, because they considered in that day, when you read the writings of the ancient Middle East, you'll find that they referred to someone naked when they were in their underwear, basically, what we would call underwear. Now, that doesn't sound much better, right? But at the same time, it's not totally nude. It would have been like for three years, God calling you, if you're a prophet of God. Now, let me back up before I even say that. Isaiah was a man of honor and dignity. He came from a family of dignity and honor. He was the prophet of Israel, He was renowned. He would be, if you will, whoever the famous pastor is you can think of in our nation. He was the Billy Graham of his day. That's probably the best analogy I can give you. So imagine if God said to Billy Graham, I want you to do your crusades in your underwear. Now we smile about that. Oh my goodness, that's kind of, how could you even say that? That's what God's asking Isaiah to do. And I want you to realize how serious this was and, and what a big step this would have been in obedience for Isaiah. He's a man of honor and dignity And he's saying, I will be so dishonored and so humbled if God asked me to, to do anything God asked me to do. And that challenged me because I started thinking, would I be willing to do anything, no matter how dishonoring or humiliating or embarrassing it was, if I knew that it was God? Now, God's probably not gonna ask you to walk around for three years in your underwear. So if you do that, I wouldn't advise that. But if you were a prophet of God and you knew you heard from heaven, and you knew that God said, I want you to do this as an example to the nation of Israel. Imagine how humiliating. Lord, I will do this for you. Any honor, any dignity in the world's eyes, out the window. But isn't that how we're supposed to be as believers anyway? Don't get me wrong. Not trying to be dishonored. Not trying to be humiliated. Not trying to be embarrassed. That's not what I'm saying. You know, willfully obnoxious or something is not my point. I'm saying, as followers of the Lord, are we willing to lose our reputation? Are we willing to look even foolish if somebody, you mean you believe the Bible literally? Hey guys, come here, you gotta meet this guy. He believes the Bible literally, what an idiot. Yeah, I do, I do. And I'll stand naked before you in my honesty and naked before the world. I believe in the word of God literally. And I would rather stand before God one day and him say to me, Mark, that was foolish. You shouldn't have believed my word. You were wrong. I'd rather hear that than stand before him one day and him say, why didn't you believe my word? I gave it to you clearly in the Bible. Oh, foolish not to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Remember what Jesus said to the, 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 the disciples on the road to, uh, Dam- I'm not Damascus, uh, but the Emmaus road. They said, well, you know, I know that this, you know, that everybody said that and, and they were saying that he rose from the dead and all that. And he said, oh, foolish ones. Not to believe the Bible. You see, when somebody's mocking you for whatever, and that's an easy example to pull out, you're not the one that's foolish. You may be embarrassed and humiliated in the world's eyes and have people mocking you, but in God's eyes, you're the honored one. You're the elevated one. You're the exalted one. You're the one that he's gonna say to you one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And Isaiah, he said, I'm laying it all down for you, Lord. You ask me to do it, I'll do it. And so it wasn't just the humility and the embarrassment of a Billy Graham of the nation walking around in his underwear, doing his, his, his outreaches in his underwear, to make a point, about they were basically what God was saying is, you are stripped naked before me in heaven. You are ashamed to heaven. This is the way that Isaiah feels right now, embarrassed in front of everyone in the nation. That's what I feel about you right now as a people. Wow. And he wanted them to see that. And he wanted a servant who would be willing to lay it all down and say, Lord, if you want to use me to show the people that, I'll do it. I may not be a popular pastor. I may be embarrassed. I may be made fun of. I may be mocked. I may end up with, you know, CNN or people with you know, placards out front walking around, but I don't care. I'm gonna do it in love, but I'm gonna do what you told me to do. That was Isaiah. See, this is what's good now. But it wasn't just that. It was now walk around barefoot. That's, that's really hard to do on rocks. And I'm telling you, the whole Middle East, as I said, it's all these rocks. So God, God made him walk around very uncomfortably. God made him live a life of humility and embarrassment for three years. Now, there's some that say, well, maybe it wasn't always wearing that underwear, if you will. Maybe, maybe every day for three years, he wore it for a certain time in front of the people and would prophesy or whatever and then put his clothes back on. We don't know, but look, the way I look at it is, whether or not it was all the time or just part of the day, that's very humiliating. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not a prophet, you know? I mean, think about it. Put yourself, put yourself in his, well, he didn't have sandals. I was gonna say, put yourself in his sandals. Put yourself in his bare feet. 
And imagine, again, I, I, this is amazing to me what God asked him to do. But again, God again was making the picture. That's what you're like to me. You're, you're an embarrassment. You're a humiliation. You, know, you're, you should be ashamed of yourself. And now he's going to speak of their shame. He says, now verse 3, then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years for a sign. Again, living it out in front of you. For a sign and a wonder. Notice this. This is what really gets me in this. Against Egypt and Ethiopia. Now Stop. That's not really the end of the sentence, but stop there for a minute. What he's saying is, I want you, Mark, let's make this personal for a minute. I don't want to do that because I'm <laughs> painting pictures you can't get rid of. I'm your pastor. Let's go back. Fill in the, Isaiah, I want you to walk around in your underwear for three years because of two nations that can't see you and don't even know you're here to make a point. Lord, isn't there somebody like in Egypt you could have walk around in their underwear? Isn't somebody in Ethiopia, can they walk around in their underwear for three years? It does, this, why are you, there's a reason. Notice what he says. It, it, this is against, as a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia. So, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and the Ethiopians as captives. So in other words, Egypt and Ethiopia are going to be taken captive by Assyria as well. Young and old, naked and barefoot. That's what they would do. Is that he, here's why we do that. Not, not only were they naked before God and all the other examples there, but what the Assyrians would do is when they captured a people, they would strip you down naked. And some believe actually completely naked. Not, not probably just wearing your underwear, which is probably all that God was asking Isaiah to do. But strip down completely naked. And they would put hooks in your jaws and connect you to the person in front of you. You'd have a line of people naked with hooks in their, in their jaws, big hooks. So if you tried to escape, you'd rip your jaw out. And yet you had to feel that pain the whole time as they marched you hundreds of miles back to where they were, naked, walking on the rocks in the, in the heat of the desert. Imagine that, horrible. But he's saying, this is what's gonna happen. Why was he telling them this was gonna happen to Egypt and Ethiopia? Because Israel was looking to Egypt and Ethiopia to get out of their problems rather than looking to God. They're going, well, we'll run to Egypt. They'll help us. We'll run to Ethiopia. They'll help us. He says, look, look at Isaiah for three years. See what's happening. See what Isaiah's doing? That's what's going to happen to Egypt. That's what's going to happen to Ethiopia. You're going to run to them and they're already naked with hooks in their jaws. You're going to be naked with hooks in your jaws if you do that. You need to run to me. And again, there's a huge lesson in this he's going to come back to again. And that is when we're in big trouble, it's not man that's going to help us. There's nothing wrong in having friends that help you out in hard times. We all understand that in the right context. But as far as the one that's really your help, it's going to be God. God is our help. And he wants them to learn that. Notice what he says. He says they're going to take them captive, young and old, naked, to the shame of Egypt. It was obviously shameful to be naked. He says they shall be, a, a, their, uh, sorry, with their buttocks uncovered to their shame. So God gets very detailed. They're, they're going to be bare-bottomed, we'd say. I mean, he, he doesn't hold anything back here. How embarrassing. You know, and that's not as embarrassing as, as the whole body being naked. But even at that whole point, it's just, it's humiliating. It's embarrassing. And he goes, they'll be ashamed of Ethiopia, their expect, uh, expectation, and Egypt, their glory. They're going to be afraid and ashamed of them, he says. And the inhabitant of this territory will say in that day, that is Israel, surely such is our expectation. Uh, wherever we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, how shall we escape? In other words, we can't run to Egypt and Ethiopia because they've already been captured. And we can't run to them or they're going to be captured. They can't help us any. So um, we shouldn't look to them. And so now we see again Isaiah being faithful to his father to humiliate himself to the point of almost total nudity for three years to be a testimony and a witness. Notice this, that the children of Israel might be saved. You know, I can think of someone else that was faithful almost to nudity so that his people could be saved. And that was Jesus when they stripped him and hung him on a cross. Most believe he probably was wrapped in a loincloth, we would say modern day underwear, and that was it, and nailed to the cross, bleeding the God of the universe. You know, I think about Isaiah humbling himself that way, going, Lord, wow, that would be so hard. I don't know, could I do that? Could I humble myself that way for three years? How embarrassing, you know? And the God of the universe said, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna become a man, and I'll let them strip me down to my underwear and mock me and spit on me and make fun of me, and everybody just, it'd be to my shame. I'm not doing it just because I want to be ashamed. I'm not doing it because I want to be humiliated. I'm doing it because I love you. If you don't think Jesus loves you, you have no clue how much he loves you. How many husbands in this room would walk around 
in their underwear. That's not a good, let's, let's get, but there's got to be another example. <laughs> How many husbands would be willing to be in some way publicly humiliated for three years for their wife if they knew it would protect her and show her love? Think about that. How many wives would be willing to do it for husbands? I start with husbands because the responsibility starts there, but how many of us for anybody would be willing to totally humiliate ourselves for the sake of somebody else that we loved them that much? We're concerned that we don't want to look stupid. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want people to make fun of us. The God of the universe said, I'll do it. And he did it because he loves you. Wow. Don't ever think he doesn't love you. If he loved me, then why? I don't know why. I don't know why, but who else, who else got stripped down naked for you and let them nail them to a piece of wood? Who else did that? Anybody you know of? He loves you more than you'll ever know. Amazing. Now we come to the fall of Babylon. <clears throat> Again, we're going to see Babylon here. Uh, we're, now we get into world history, all right? He's going to talk about, and we, and we can, Isaiah was looking forward. We can now look back and see that everything he said happened. As a matter of fact, Isaiah is so detailed like Daniel and some of the other prophets that those who simply don't believe the Bible because they're worried about what people will think, they don't, they're afraid, they don't want the world to make fun of them. They're not willing to walk around in a loincloth for three years, we might say, in analogy. They say, well, obviously this couldn't be really Isaiah that wrote this. It was somebody later after it happened because it's too accurate. I'm like, you're missing the whole point. That's what prophecy is and that's how God proves he's God. <laughs> and if God's not God, then why are we following him? And if prophecy doesn't predict the future, then it's not prophecy. So you're missing the whole thing here. But either way, here we go. He says, the burden against the wilderness of the sea. What a great name, the wilderness of the sea. And then just like this dichotomy in your brain, this is how they referred to Babylon. They called it the wilderness of the sea. Why? Because it was next to these rivers. It was next to the Tigris and the Euphrates and these mighty rivers of that region. And they had lots of other streams and tributaries that came off of these rivers. So because of all the water, they referred to it as the wilderness of the sea. And again, referring to other waters besides the ocean as the sea is not unusual in the Middle East. They call the Sea of Galilee the Sea of Galilee. And really, it's just a body of water. It's a lake. So the burden against the wilderness of the sea, Babylon, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it comes from the desert, from a terrible land. He's now speaking of their future judgment. Now, this is interesting. Let me make a comment before I go on because I want to delay this foundation. Assyria is, the, is, is not the world power, but Assyria is the regional power at this time. There was no world power. Assyria was the regional power over, over the whole Middle East at this time. Then Babylon will come into power after that. So he's already bypassing Babylon ruling and jumping straight to their judgment. Remember, prophecy jumps all over the place. When you read prophetically, you've got to have a timeline in your brain as you learn the Bible over, over time because God will talk about things that happen like just in a series in power and also he jumps now to beyond Babylon's rule to their judgment. So he's jumping hundreds of years in advance right here. And so you have to understand what's happening. That's why it's important to know that timeline in your mind. But Babylon will become the first world power. And that's going to be in about, well, Time-wise, it's going to be still quite some time before Babylon takes over completely and rules everything. After Babylon, then comes the Medes and the Persians, and they'll rule the entire world. That's the next world empire. Then Alexander the Great, that's the third world empire from this point. And then the fourth world empire from that point is the Roman Empire. Okay, so you got those, that's, those are the four main world powers. There have been other rulers and other kings and other whatever, but as far as world powers go, and then we've had this break, if you will, of someone that, tr that controls the entire world. Now, America probably could have. We had the power at one point if we wanted to take the whole world over, but we didn't, and God didn't allow us to because God didn't prophesy that. He didn't say we would, but the last world power that really controlled it all was Rome, and now for 2,000 years, that's been laying dormant. Maybe not quite 2,000 as far as Rome, a little bit less than that. But 2,000 since Israel was there, lesser than that for Rome, maybe 15, 1,600 years, whatever. And then now Rome's going to be revived in the last days. So the fifth and final world kingdom will be the revived Roman Empire, I believe, in our days, which is happening right now. That'll be America shrinking, if you will, in its influence. I think we all see that happening right now, don't we? And Europe rising back up to be the world power, it'll be a revived 
Roman Empire, which I think is what's happening now with the World Economic Forum, the World Summit, a governmental summit, and all these things that are happening. It's the foundation for what the, what the Antichrist is going to step into. And he's preparing all the nations right now. God is. All the nations are being prepared to lay their sovereignty down. So that's currently what's happening. That doesn't mean that we don't fight to keep our sovereignty until the very last. I don't think that we should say, well, this is all going to happen anyway, so let's all just lay down and give up. That's not what we're to do. We're to fight for what's right till the very end. We fight and we stand for what's right until we can't fight and stand for what's right any longer. But there's going to come a point where our fight's going to be futile. The worlds will lay down all their sovereignties. All walls will come down. Everybody will be united as one. And then on the scene will come this world leader out of Europe who will be supernaturally empowered, not by God, but by, the Antichrist, uh, by Satan. He'll be the one that we refer to as the Antichrist. So that's kind of the layout of world history. At the end of that, as you know, Jesus comes back and he will rule and reign for a thousand years. He'll get into all of this, but I want you to have that, again, reminder of where we are before we jump into it. So now we're at the first world empire while Assyria is still reigning. So he's looking futuristically to this first world empire and actually their judgment uh, by God when, when uh, the Medo-Persians will take over. Verse 2, a distressing vision is declared to me. The treacherous dealer deals treacherously and the plunderers plunder. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all its sighing I have made to cease. Now, Elam and Media, that's the region of the Medo-Persian Empire. That's the Medes and the Persians. That's Iran, Iraq area. Okay, that's where the Medo-Persian Empire was. Part of it, Assyria. Assyria, Iran, Iraq, that whole region right there is the Medes and the Persians. And what he's saying is, and they're going to come in the story. This is about 200 years from this point right here when, when, when he's talking about. So this is about 200 years later, this is going to happen. So you can see prophetically him looking forward. Therefore, my loins are filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold of me like the pangs of a woman in labor. I was distressed when I heard it. I was dismayed when I saw it. My heart wavered. Fearfulness frightened me. The night for which I long turned into fear for me. He's kind of living out. He's literally seeing what's going to happen to Babylon. And he's feeling their fear. He's feeling their anxiety. God is allowing him to experience what they're going to go through so this prophet can express it. He says, prepare the table. Set a watchman in the tower. Eat and drink. Arise, you princes, anoint the shield. Now, there's so much here in verse 5 because this is what happened the night that Babylon fell. Remember Belshazzar? Nebuchadnezzar was the first ruler of Babylon. His grandson, Belshazzar, sometime later was ruling at this time. And remember, Belshazzar was having a party with the implements of God from the temple. You remember the story in Daniel chapter 5. They'd taken all the things that they captured from Israel when they overthrew Israel and took them captive into Babylon. They brought all the things from the temple into the banqueting hall, God's holy articles. And Belshazzar's throwing a party. They're drinking out of them. They're having this big party. And, and yet right outside the walls of Babylon is the Medo-Persian army ready to attack and destroy them. And they're in their party. Like, say, you know what? Pfft, I'm not going to worry about it. You know, eat, drink, be merry. Tomorrow we'll die. Just let's party up while we still can. It's this whole attitude of, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Just let's just live how we want now. Is that not how many people live today? You know, who cares about tomorrow? Who cares about what's going to happen? I don't care. I'm not even thinking about eternity. I'm glad God worked for you, but eternity, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm just going to have fun. Well, one day your fun's going to stop. And then suddenly eternity is thrust upon you. What then? I remember hearing Charles Finney, a famous uh, you know, evangelist. Uh, I believe he was in the 1700s, maybe the 18. I don't remember off the top of my head. Many of you heard of Charles Finney. You might know uh, just a great revivalist and all this. And he said he was, he was a lawyer. And, uh, and he said he realized something was missing in his life. And he said somebody asked him, so Charles Finney, what are you going to do when you, you know, you know, uh, when you graduate you know, high school? I'm going to go, or when you get out of law school, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, finish law school and go on and get my, my, my practice. What are you going to do after that? Well, then I'll just do the law the best I can and try to make up a you know, good inheritance and build all this. Well, what, what then? What after that? Well, then I'll just you know, try to, I guess, if I'm older, live out my life comfortably. And, and, and I guess that's what I'll do. What, what after that? And he realized, I, I don't know. I never thought that far ahead in my mind. And that's what led him to Christ. He said, you know, you need to have a plan because this world's temporary. It's going away fast and you need a long-term plan. How many of us in this room have long-term financial plans? Maybe not everyone, but no doubt some. And yet how many of us in this room have eternal plans? Probably all of us or most of us as believers here. But how much of the world has long-term plans or portfolios? They think about the temporary. 
What about after that? What then? See, you got to think beyond that. And so Belshazzar was like, partied up. We don't care. Prepare. And that's what this is talking about. Prepare the table. We're having a big party tonight. We're going to bring out the implements of God from the, from that we took out of Jerusalem. Set a watchman in the tower. Look, somebody put somebody up there. Let them watch the Medes and the Persians. We're going to party tonight. It's on me. Everybody's invited. Eat and drink, which is what they did. Remember the writing on the wall? Um, Many, many tickle your farson, you know, you're, you've been weighed, you know, in, in the balances and come up, you know, wanting. And basically, you know, God's looked at you and you're a lightweight, Belshazzar. You're going to be judged. That's what happened. This is what he's talking about. It's going to be still yet in the future. But he's talking about it 200 years before it happens. And now he says in the last part of five, what they should have been saying and should have been doing, arise, you princes, anoint the shield. What was, get ready for battle. You shouldn't be partying. You should be getting ready for battle. The Medes are about to attack. Why anoint the shield? That was something they would do when they'd go into battle. You take oil, rub it all over your shield. So when you held the shield, if a spear hit it or a sword or an arrow or whatever, it was more likely to, to scoot off. You know, somebody runs at you, you know, and they hit this slick shield. They may slip to the side and you can stab them or whatever. So they'd put oil all over their shields for battle. That's what they should have been doing. For thus the Lord has said to me, go, set a watchman. Let him declare what he sees. And he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen, a chariot of donkeys, and a chariot of camels. By the way, oh yeah, and he listened earnestly with great care. That caught my attention, chariot of camels. They, they, they use sometimes on rare occasion camels for chariots. I've never seen that, but they did. I was reading today, there's still some places that use camels to pull wagons and chariots. And that's kind of a funny sight to me. But either way, he sees the battlement coming toward him. And he listened earnestly with great, great care. And the watchman cried out and said, a lion, my lord. Now the lion was the symbol of Babylon. And now we see the lion being attacked, if you will, by the Medes and the Persians. I stand continually on the watchtower in the daytime, the watchman was saying. I've sat at my post every night. And look, he can speak him prophetically. This is a, a prophetic picture of what God is showing him. And look, here comes a chariot with a men, uh, of men with a pair of horsemen. Again, you had, remember Elam and, um, and, the, and Media, the Persians here attacking. That may be symbolic, the pair of horsemen, the Medes and the Persians. They're coming in to attack you, Belshazzar. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the carved images of her gods has broken to the ground. Oh, my threshing and the grain of my floor, that which I've heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I've declared to you. It's, it's really interesting uh, what, the way that the Medes and the Persians <clears throat> conquered Babylon. The Tigris River flowed through, literally flowed through the city of Babylon. And they had gates that were down in the water, so that you couldn't get in through that way to block it. And of course, you had a water supply and all that went there. Well, what, what the Medes and the Persians did was they, they blocked up the water enough upstream. They dammed it up somehow enough upstream to where it made the water level drop low enough where their armies could go in, go under those gates. And while Belshazzar and all those guys were in there partying, they just walked right into the city. They came right up in the middle of the city and found a bunch of drunk people partying. All the leaders drunk and they just wiped them out. Easy, easy victory. Now, they had this great confidence that nobody could conquer Babylon because the walls were like 300 feet tall and there were like something like six chariots across wide. I mean, they were massively thick and high walls. So they said, nobody can ever break in and conquer Babylon. No, not by breaking the wall down, maybe. But God, when it's time to judge, nothing can stop God from his judgment. And so God had a better idea, just dropped the waters, going under the gate and just walked in and conquered them. And so again, a tragic end to a place that God was being, that was being judged by the Lord, Babylon. Now he goes and prophesies a proclamation against Edom. Remember in your mind, Amy, everybody remember I showed you the other day, A-M-E of the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites on the other side of Israel, okay? If you have that picture in your mind, if you were here, it says, uh, I used the first letters of each of those, so you'd remember that picture in your mind. Now he talks about Edom. They're in the lower area, Edom and Duma. Duma is that lower area down where Petra is and all that region. And so is Seir, which is uh, one of the heights there of, of Petra, one of the mountains of Petra. That's why it's called Seir. He says, the burden against Duma, he calls to me out of Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Again, this whole picture of a watchman on the wall saying, okay, we saw what happened here to Babylon, listening to what the watchman was saying. He saw the attack coming. What about the watchman of Edom? And the watchman said, the morning comes and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire, return and come back. And unless you want to know more, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, that's all he tells us here. But what does he mean? It seems kind of an odd, obscure prophecy. But the morning comes and also the night. That is, there's gonna, it's going to look like you're going to be okay. The morning comes. It looks like you're going to be fine. But you know what? You're going to be wiped out as well. You're going to be taken out. You're going to be destroyed. And so the night is coming. So uh, kind of this 
uh, obscure prophecy, but speaking of them thinking they're okay, and then sudden destruction comes on them as well. Now he goes to Arabia, which we know is Saudi Arabia today. The burden against Arabia. In the forest of Arabia you will lodge, O you traveling companies of the Dedanites, you inhabitants of the land of Tema. Now Tema and Dedan, Sheba and Dedan as well. These are the what, modern day Saudi Arabia. Um, that's this region here. They also are going to be uh, judged. He says, bring water to him who is thirsty. It's a very thirsty land. With their bread they met them who fled. So they're going to flee to that place. And he's saying, give them water and bread. For they fled from the swords, that is the swords of battle, from the drawn sword, from the bent bow, and from the distress of war. So they're running from war, but again, the Assyrians are going to eventually capture them and overthrow them as well. As we see here in verse 16, he says, For thus says the Lord has said to me, within a year, according to the year of a hired man. Now well, that's interesting, the, the definition he gives to it, because the year of a hired man, when you hired someone, they only worked for the days you hired them. So it wasn't like just about a year, it was literally a year. To the day, he's saying right now, a year to the day, like the day of a hired man. He's not going to work one day more. He's not going to work one day less because of the pay that he's getting, so to speak, for the analogy here. Within a year, according to the year of a hired man, all of the glory of Kedar, that is Saudi Arabia, will fail. And the remainder of the number of archers, the mighty men of the people of Kedar, same region, will be diminished for the Lord God of Israel has spoken. Now we can look back historically and see that's exactly what Assyria did to all that region. So again, these prophecies were uh, way in advance, but again, God being true to his word. Chapter 22, the burden against the Valley of Vision. Now he speaks of Jerusalem. That's that region right around Israel's, the Valley of Vision, that whole Kidron Valley and, and the surrounding valley there. He says, what ails you now that you have all gone up to the housetops? Again, We've talked about it before, but in case you haven't heard this, remember, they, they lived on their housetops as an extra room during this time. You, you, your housetop was like another room. It's just an outdoor room on your roof. You put a, a gate around it, and everybody go up there. It's like your outdoor patio, so to speak. It was an extra room on the house. As a matter of fact, they still do that today. If you go to the city of David right down below the Temple Mount, and you look down at the city of David, uh, you'll see the houses built down in there. There's still people. They'll have their laundry out there on the roof, and they're up on the roof. And it's kind of interesting because you can see how David... They now found his palace, the remains of it, and it's there at the very top of the city of David. You have the, the Mount of Olives, if you can picture, I'm sorry, uh, the Temple Mount, if you can picture that in your mind. If you're looking at it from the Mount of Olives, so picture that in your mind, you're looking at the Temple Mount, go to your left, and, it, and there's a break there, and it goes down this slight slope, this hill. That's the city of David. The city of David is that slope that goes down. David's palace was at the very top. Right you came off the Temple Mount, right here at the top of this hill before it started descending was David's palace. And so when you see that they use their rooftops for another extra room or whatever the case might be, now you understand how David went out on his rooftop or his balcony or patio or whatever he went out on, and he could easily look down at all the rooftops in the city of David. He saw them all, all the way down. And there's Bathsheba. So again, you can see how that could happen when it talks about them on the rooftops. Well, now they're back up on the rooftops here in this prophecy. And here's why. Notice this. They've got up on their rooftops because it was also a great vantage point to see what was going on in the city. And why, did, why would they all go to their rooftops to see what was going on? Look at verse 2. You're full of noise. A tumultuous city? A joyous city. Which is it? In other words, everybody's in their house, imagine, and you hear this uproar of the people. And go, go up on the roof, let's go. And everyone's up loot to see what's happening. Everybody's on the roof looking at the city to find out what's going on, trying to get a good view. And they're going, is everybody rejoicing? Is this a, a loud noise of rejoicing? Is something happening we don't know about, we need to see? Or is this a sound of sorrow? Are we being attacked? I mean, what's going on? So the prophet asked the question, is the noise because of tumult or because of joy? And now he answers it. Your slain men, obviously it's not of joy. Because he starts out saying it has to do with those that are slain. Your slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. They're dead and they're slain. You can see them from your rooftop, in other words. But it wasn't because the army came in. All your rulers have fled together. They are captured by the archers. All who are found in you are bound together and they have fled from afar. What he's saying is you're under siege. And we know historically what happened. They were put under siege again by Babylon. And when Babylon put them under siege, he's looking prophetically to that time, all their people start dying. Start running out of food. Start running out of water. Then people begin wailing in the streets. I need food. I need this or whatever. So everybody go on the rooftop. What's the noise? What's the thing? And they see people laying dead in the streets. They hear the tumult. And they say, you're not dead by sword. There's not an army coming in. You're still behind the walls of Jerusalem. But now your people are dying because they don't have any food. They don't, they don't have the supplies that they need. 
Therefore, I said, look away from me. Now we see the weeping of the prophet. It reminds me of Jeremiah. And here in the sense that when the prophet sees what's happening to his people, he begins to weep. He says, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. He's weeping over his people and their judgment because they wouldn't repent. They brought it on themselves. Do not labor to comfort me because of the plundering of the daughter of my people. For it is a day of trouble and treading down and perplexity by the Lord of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and crying to the mountain. Elam bore the quiver with chariots and men and horsemen and Kerr uncovered the shield. So you see Medo and Persians here again are involved. They've been involved in battle as well. It shall come to pass that your choicest valley shall be full of chariots and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. So even as Babylon was attacking the Medes and Persians before they were in a place of power, they were joining in. And oftentimes when people would attack Israel, their enemies would also join in. They still do it today. You'll see them attacked from all sides because everybody tries to take advantage of that when they're getting attacked. And notice the reason. This is so huge to me. I have this underlined with stars on either side of it just because of what it said to me. Verse eight, he removed the protection of Judah. What a sad sentence. In other words, God didn't really have to bring judgment. We know that he did. But all God has to do to a nation like he did to Israel, all he has to do to America today is remove his hand of protection. Do you think that God has been protecting our nation over the years? Absolutely. And this has nothing to do with us being a sinless nation. Nobody's saying that. It has nothing to do with being a perfect nation. That's not the point. The point is because there are so many believers here, God has protected America. And by the way, the only reason that America hasn't been totally wiped out right now is because of you guys. It's astounding to me to understand from a biblical standpoint, the reason God hadn't judged America for 60 some million babies we've put to death through abortion, which is the big issue right now. Um, the fact that we're just thumbing our nose at God and we're changing God's structure of how he created mankind. We're changing all the rules and saying, it's not like you said, God, when it comes to people. And it's not like we're gonna change everything. We're making our own rules. We're gonna do it. Typically, you know, God brings judgment in on nations like this. And, and I think eventually there will be judgment brought in on us if we don't repent as a nation. And some would argue that it's already started. But the reason that we're not judged right now is because of you guys. God's protecting America because of the believers. That's one reason. And the second reason is the believers in America that are standing with Israel. God said, if you bless Israel, I'll bless you. So you have the two reasons, believers and blessing Israel. If we quit blessing Israel and the believers are all gone, what do you think is gonna happen to this world? Again, when the rapture takes place, and all the salt of the earth is removed worldwide, you talk about the meat rotting really fast. It's gonna turn so ugly overnight, you can't even imagine. I mean, look how fast things changed with COVID, how quick, overnight. The whole world changed like that. Imagine if all of a sudden all of the salt and a lot of the world was just gone, right? Now the Lord's still gonna be working with his Holy Spirit in the earth, there'll still be some saved after that. But imagine what this world's gonna be like. All he has to do is remove his hand. You know, you think about, I think about, you know, you want to see a, a personal example of it. How many of us as Christians, you know, we've not been walking with the Lord the way we should either. And God still protects us, doesn't he? He'll chastise us, but his hand of protection, if you've ever been in a backslidden state and you've seen God's hand of protection, you know, I should have died right then. I should have been taken out, but God protected me. Lord, please forgive me. We come back to God and we ask forgiveness and we get right with God. That's, God does that for nations as well. God doesn't look on any person and say, you're perfect, so I'm gonna protect you. Or a nation, you're perfect, so I'm gonna protect you. God says, I see your sins, but I'm gonna protect you because you know me and because you love me and you need to repent, but I'm gonna protect you. All he has to do is remove that. I'm gonna remove that protection. That's scary because that's the only thing keeping us from being wiped out by the enemy. You know, there are times in, in my life where God allows the enemy to come in spiritually and attack me in some really heavy ways. And he does you too. That's how I know, I know he does you. He, 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 all of us, God allows us all to go through testings and trials. There are times in your life it's been very dark. And if there hadn't been, there's gonna be some moments of darkness. I'm not trying to scare you, but you're gonna have some moments of I've never had it this dark in my life. What's going on? Because God will back away a little bit so that you can grow and you can learn to trust him. And he, he's gonna, are you gonna be faithful to him? I love that in the scripture where it says about Hezekiah. God had a lot of testing for Hezekiah, who's gonna be the king that God conquers the Assyrians, you know, Sennacherib, when Hezekiah's king, and we'll read more about what happened during his reign here in a moment. But with Hezekiah, it says, God withdrew from Hezekiah to see what was in his heart. Wow. If God withdrew from you tonight, 
you would realize how much he's protecting you. And you would realize how much of his spirit is what keeps you in good spirits. What happens when God withdraws? Do we yell at him? Do we get mad at him? I can't believe God you would do. I wondered, Mark, what would happen if I just backed away a little bit. When I first got saved, it was like all of you guys. You know what it was like. Remember when you first got saved? It's like, man, this is the best. I mean, it's just, it's just the best. It's like the baby just being carried around by daddy all day. You know, all they have to do is just, just you know, whatever you want. What do you want? Here, have this. You just do whatever. You love them. They're, you're having a great time. Everything's new and exciting, and you're so protected, whatever. And you think, I could never turn away. This is, God, you're so good. And then one day God begins to kind of say, you know, now I'm not going to, I'm still here, but I'm not going to hold you as close. I'm not leaving you, but I want you to learn to walk with me. And I want you to learn to, you know, to, there's going to be troubles in life. I want to prepare you. You've got to be ready. I want you to grow. And it doesn't feel the same. How do we respond to God? Some of you tonight, it doesn't feel the same. So what do you, are, are you, what's your feeling about that? What's your thought about that? Are you upset with God? God, where are you? Maybe God is just saying, I just want to see what's in your heart. Here's God's question. Will you love me even when it doesn't feel good? Does God give us any other examples of that in life? Yeah. Marriage. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's really hard. And when it gets really hard, the question is, do you still love your wife? Do you still love your husband? Do you still love your kids? God backs away. God backs away. He says, I want to find out. Do you love me even when it doesn't feel good? See, that's what true biblical love is. It's a commitment that is outside of feelings. Feelings come and go. But co covenants don't. It's really, it's really a marriage covenant. And our relationship to God is what? It, he calls it a what? Covenant. It's a covenant. He says, are you going to keep your covenant? You know? Challenging things, but good things. He removed the protection of Judah. Hmm, let's see what happens. You looked in that day to the... And when he, look, when he removed his protection, look what they did. They looked to, in that day to their armor of the house of the forest. He says, you also saw the damage to the city of David that was great and you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. It's like, you started doing everything you could do to fix it, but you didn't look to me. The nation's falling apart. Our politicians are crazy. Inflation's out the roof. Everything's being destroyed. Are we running to the next guy to vote for to fix it? Or to God? God? The next guy, the next gal, they can't fix this. I don't care what party or how great they are, how charismatic or how much their policies are wonderful. Only God can fix America. And that's only gonna come from repentance and turning to God. So what God is saying to Israel is, look, I'm judging you. And rather than being broken and repenting, you're figuring out how you can fix it without me. I don't need God. We'll just throw more money at it. We don't need God, we'll add another program. We don't need God, we'll just whatever, fill in the blank. But there comes a point when God is judging a nation where God says, there is no more money. There's no more bills to pass. There's no more elections that'll work. There's no party that can rescue you. There's no feelings or viewpoints, no matter where you are. You need God. And God, I believe, is bringing America to that place, just like he did Israel. That's where he's bringing Israel. And God is bringing America to a place where he's saying, you can't get out of this one. You can't finagle your way by your wisdom in your economy or your great military or your cleverness in your elections or who's going to be your leader. You can't do it. I'm going to back you in a corner until you get so broken that you go, we need God. And that's what he's doing to Israel. I believe that's what he's doing to us. So there's a lot of analogies here that cross over. Notice he says, you've gathered water. You're, you're getting your, your guns together. You've got your lower water. You're storing up your food. And by the way, there's nothing wrong. And we talked about this. If there's going to be like shortages of this and that, there's nothing wrong in having a generator, a little bit of food, a little bit of water. That's wisdom. There's nothing wrong in that. But if you think you're going to store up enough to survive a nation that God's going to judge, it's not going to work. Now, Joseph did it, but he had the whole government behind him and put seven years worth of grain away. Right? In, mass, in massive silos. 
What he's going to make the point is there's not enough water you can store. There's not enough food you can store. There's not enough stuff you can do if I'm going to bring judgment. Now, here's the good news. Remember what he said earlier in Isaiah? And if you remember this or not, but he said earlier, he said, when I start judging the nation of Israel and I will remove their food and their water and all their, I'll start taking all that away, he said, when I start judging them. He said, however, for the righteous, it will be well. What does that mean? I don't know, but I like it. You know what it means? I'll make sure you have food. I'll make sure you have water. You did good putting a couple of months away, but this is gonna last for three years, for five years. You're gonna need more than that. You're gonna need me, Mark. So you did good. You're being wise. You're not being foolish. You're planning. Good for you. But you can't handle this. This is way too big for you. So I'm gonna take care of you and I'm gonna bless you. I'll make sure you have food. I'll make sure you have water. The Bible says, I've, David said, I've never seen the righteous what? Begging bread or forsaken. How, how is he gonna do it? I don't know. I don't know. I know with Jacob and his family, they were in the famine. There was that seven year famine. For the first two years, they didn't even know their brother was running the world. They didn't know their, he didn't know his son was running the world, you know? Down there with Pharaoh at that time, the world power, so to speak. And God fed them in the middle of a desert for two years. Made sure they had water, made sure they had food. God is faithful. We can rest. I don't want you to lose sleep and panic. Be wise. You know, if you can plant a garden, plant one. Share a tomato. Don't throw any. He says, but you're looking to your own devices here. You're going to your armory. You're gathering up the water. You numbered the houses of Jerusalem. In your houses, you broke down to fortify the walls. You're making your walls stronger. You also made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. That is what they did was, remember down where the Gion Spring is, they, Ezekiah did this amazing feat where he, he dug from one end of the, of the mountain to the other. He took the water inside of Jerusalem and built that tunnel, what we call Hezekiah's tunnel. And it was a pool of water. And then they, then they built another wall around it, an extra wall. So when the armies came in, they couldn't get to the water supply. So they said, you built a wall around it. You built the tunnel, the Gihon Springs. You brought the water in. Way to go, Hezekiah. This wasn't bad. God's not rebuking Hezekiah for building that tunnel. He's not rebuking anyone for being prepared. He's speaking to them nationally and saying, if you're looking to all those things that you can do to rescue yourself, you're going to fail. Be prepared, but look to me and I'll provide. Because look what he says at the last year. Verse 11, you made a reservoir between the two walls. For the, pool of, uh, for the water of the old pool, but you didn't look to its maker. You had all your plans and all your bunkers and all your whatever, right? But you didn't look to me. Now, I know a lot of believers who are storing up things and that's fine and they do look to God. So I'm not saying because you're storing things up, you're not looking to God. I'm not accusing anyone of trusting in their own devices and their own flesh. That's not my, I'm not making, I'm saying this is what I think some are doing and I think this is what Israel's doing, especially unbelievers today. They're trying to store up and, and have other things, you know, and, and the good news that we have is that even if we do run out of supply, our God is our supply. The world didn't have that. When they run out of supply, they're on their own. When we, when we run out of supply, we look to the one who never runs out of supply. And if I don't stop talking, we'll finish this chapter. This is all we're going, but... Nor did you respect him who fashioned it long ago. You didn't respect me and you didn't look to me. And that day, the Lord God of hosts called for weeping and mourning. So I, I called you to repent, to weep, to mourn, to say, you, know, you need to be repenting. Don't start planning. You can't out plan judgment. You have to repent so the judgment stops. Again, I think the most frustrating for, thing for a believer, and many of you are experiencing this, and as a pastor and teaching the word of God, it really frustrates me. I know exactly what we could do in Congress today to turn our nation around immediately. Immediately. Repent. God, forgive us of killing our babies. Lord, forgive us of denying your creation and the way you made a man and a woman. Lord, forgive us of, all, of stealing, cheating, lying. Forgive us of our adultery. Forgive us of turning. God, forgive us of hating each other. Let us love each other. Repent. And God said, the, the windows of heaven would open. He would, God is the one that would heal. He would do it all. It would just be, and when you know that, 
and you can't, it doesn't seem to sink into a people. It is so frustrating. It's like, I know the answer. It's, it's like when you're watching, you know, um, you know, animals that are killing themselves. I mean, you know, they're, they're trying to get away or something, jumping off a little cliff. You see situations. I've watched, I've watched animals sometimes. You can't, you can't help them. They're doing things that are destroying themselves. You know, say, stop doing that. You're going to die. But you can't communicate with them. They don't understand. They continue to kill themselves and jump off the little cliff or whatever, right? Trying to run because they're scared from something else or whatever the case might be. And it's like the same thing with us. We're, we're throwing ourselves off cliffs when all we have to do is repent. If we would just repent. But here's the thing, guys. Where does it begin? It's easy for me to stand up here and go, America needs to repent. What about Mark? What do I need to repent of? I need to make sure that I'm clean before God. You need to make sure you're clean before God. Judgment begins where? At the house of God. So if we repent, then that light shines to the nation. So we can point to America and say, America needs to repent. We can point to our leaders and they need to repent. But it's got to start with us. The whole principle is we're the ones. He says, you didn't look to me. Verse 12, and in that day, the Lord God of hosts called for weeping and mourning, for baldness and girding of sackcloth. They would shave their head when they were uh, repenting. And, and this whole visual thing, girding with sackcloth, again, it was a sign of repentance before God. He's saying, you need to be repenting. And instead, you're not repenting. You're trying to figure out how to fix it politically. You can't fix it politically. He said, but instead, you had joy, joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating meat and drinking wine. You're acting like everything's fine. America will go on as normal forever. Israel's just going to keep going on forever. We can do whatever we want. They'll, God will never judge us. It's all going to be fine, right? That's the attitude they had. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Who cares? Just party up. Live it up now. It's great right now. Then it was revealed in my hearing by the Lord of hosts. So God spoke to Isaiah again. Surely for this iniquity, there will be no atonement for you. Even to your death, says the Lord God of hosts. And, and the way he says that, the Lord God of battle. The Lord God of hosts is the God of battle. If you don't repent, I'm going to judge you with my armies. Now he talks about Shebna, this steward over King Hezekiah's household, who was just ignoring the word of God and ignoring what Isaiah was saying, like many people in America today. If you were to preach this message in Congress today, how do you think you'd be received? From both, both sides. I'm not picking on a party and saying, if you were to go to Congress today, if you said this to the nation, how well would you be received? This guy Shebna here is like, forget this Isaiah guy. He's a nut, religious, whatever. And so look what happens. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, go, go and proceed to this steward, to Shebna, who's over the house. That is, who's, we know now historically Shebna was over the house of Hezekiah. Well, they've actually found Shebna's tomb, which is pretty amazing. And God asked Shebna, what have you here? And whom have you here? In other words, you're putting your hope in Jerusalem. I just told you it's all going to be judged. That you've hewn a sepulcher here? That is, you've, you've, you've already built your tombstone? You think you're going to stay here and die here? I'm going to judge you. Are you ignoring the words of Isaiah? Do you not hear that judgment's at the doorstep? You're acting like everything's going to be fine. You're going to continue to just, do you know, invest in your future. And what are you saying? You're not repenting. He who hews himself a sepulcher on high, you're, you're giving yourself a, this you know, royal, almost kind of sepulcher kind of thing. And it's there in, in, the, in Silwan, there on the uh, Mount, Mount of Olives today is where they found it. Who carves a tomb for himself in a rock. Indeed, the Lord will throw you away violently, O mighty man, and will surely seize you. you know, you're, a, you're a man of honor. You're, you're over Hezekiah's, you know, the king's household. And, you're, and, and Isaiah is saying, we need to repent. God's going to throw us out of Jerusalem. And you're planning for the future. Like, nah, it's going to be fine. I'm going I'm to go and get me a big sepulcher. I'm ignoring what Hezekiah is saying. It shows Shebna is ignoring God, ignoring his word. And, and God now speaks to Hezekiah. You need to speak judgment to this guy. He says, he will surely turn violently and toss you like a ball into a large country. How, that's pretty visual. Think of the Lord grabbing him and throwing him into another country. There you shall die and, your, uh, and there your glorious chariot shall be the shame of your master's house. We don't know for sure what happened to Shebna, but there are some that say Shebna uh, became a leper and was cast out of the city because of leprosy and had to leave and go to another nation. Either way, we know he was removed because God proclaimed it. So I will drive you out of your office. That is the, 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 the honored office of watching over all the king's belongings. That was a great position. The steward over the king's belongings. Imagine if you were the one in control of the White House and all its finances, right? That's what Shebna was. So I will drive you from your office and from your position. He will pull you down. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant. I'm going to remove you and I'll put my guy in, Eliakim. So we love Eliakim. 
the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe. I'll give him your, in other words, your authority and your position. I'll strengthen him with your belt. I'll commit your responsibility into his hand. You're going to be removed. He shall be a father of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut and shall shut and no one shall open. So I'm going to give him authority. Nobody can stop the authority I've given him. It reminds you of what he says to the church in the last days. I'm going to open a door no one can shut and close a door that no one can open. So God's going to keep his authority on his church until he takes us out of here in the rapture. Notice this. He says, I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. That is just like a peg in a wall. Um, he says he will become glorious and the throne to the throne of his father's house. And pegs were used for all kinds of things. Notice here, they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house. Uh, so very symbolic here of calling him a peg. The offspring and, and the posterity and all the vessels of small quantity from the cups to all, uh, to all the pitchers. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, the peg that is fastened, that is Shebna right now, in a secure place will be removed and cut down and will fall. And the burden that was on it will be cut off. For the Lord has spoken. And we know that, again, Eliakim will take his place. So we only got a couple of chapters, but we're stopping there. Obviously, I'm not gonna try to squeeze in any more, but just rich. The word of God, so rich and so full. And guys, listen, as we finish tonight, the thing I would encourage you is this. Judgment begins at the house of God, so must repentance. I said, it's easy for me to point to America. I'm in America. I'm a part of it. I contributed my portion of our, of our worthy judgment for many years before I got saved. I'm not proud of it, but I was right in the thick of it. I have repented. You have repented. And we need to make sure that we ask God's forgiveness and that we're repentant before the Lord, and we need to be praying for God to send revival to his church, that the church would repent so that God can have mercy on our nation. Because I'm telling you, the problems that we're facing right now, there's not a different party that's gonna fix it. I know that may step on some political toes. There may be some different policies that different people can bring in that can alter some things to a degree. And we've seen things that work historically. I get all that. I'm not denying the realities of certain things. But the reality is, I believe, it's not about a party in America that needs to be in power. It's about a nation that needs to repent before God. Yes. And as we repent before God, God will raise up the leaders that we need to lead us in the right direction. But it starts with us. And so tonight, let's get our heart right. Make sure that we're repentant before God. Because until we get it right, we can't be looking to the world and expect them to be getting it right. It starts with us right here. And let's pray and ask God to help us do it. So Father, we do pray tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you've shown us the answer to the ills of our nation. God, with the nation of Israel, through Isaiah, you told them, if you would stop trying to fix it yourself and turn to me, I would fix your nation. But they kept trying to fix it themselves while ignoring and disrespecting you, and it didn't work. Lord, let us learn from that failed attempt to not make the same mistake. I see our nation on the same path. We're watching, Lord, what I believe is you removing your protection from the nation. Our streets are no longer safe. Our country is vulnerable in ways it's never been. And Lord, I believe you are removing your hand of protection because we have turned away from you as a nation. I know your church is being faithful, Lord, but again, as a nation, we've turned away. And your word says that judgment begins at the house of God, that we have to be the first ones to repent. You told Israel, if you would repent, I would heal your land. Lord, we need to repent. And so I pray you would just convict us tonight, each one of us individually here, of what we need to ask forgiveness of, of what we need to repent of. Not pointing at others, but Lord, looking at ourselves and getting right before our God. And then Lord, from there, we'll let you take care of the rest. Have mercy on us and have mercy on our nation. God, send revival to your church. Send a spirit of repentance and brokenness to our nation. And Lord, let us realize that collectively we are to blame before your throne as a nation. Let us accept our guilt. And Lord, we ask that you would now have mercy on this nation, even as you have mercy on us and restore us. Only you, God, can fix our, our problems. So God, heal our land. Fix us, Lord. And we repent before you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As always, if you guys need prayer, we are up here to pray. So. Love you guys. Let's stand and worship the Lord and let's go out praising our God.
you guys here tonight. We love you. Have a blessed evening, and we'll see you back this weekend. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to our live stream. We love and appreciate every one of you. If you're in need of prayer, please call the number on your screen or visit the prayer page on our website and let us know how we can pray for you. If you're into social media, be sure and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and ring the bell to be notified when we go live or post a new video. And lastly, you can download our church app by going to calvaryknoxville.org app. Thanks again for watching. And